thanks for Stephen Judd for joining us. He's going to be presenting for us. Thank you so much. Apologies for the technical issues. We are here. Take it over, Stephen Judd. All right. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this presentation. What I'm going to be covering is PowerShell's built-in write commandlets. Now, there are other write commandlets, but the ones we're going to stick with are the ones that are native to PowerShell and come in the core functionality. And so the title of this talk is the write, write, writes, write, right? Correct. Okay, so who am I? Just do a quick introduction. I am Stephen Judd. I am a multi-year, multi-discipline IT pro. I'm also a PowerShell enthusiast. I really like PowerShell. I'm also a dad joke enthusiast. If you know anything about me or if you've ever met me, you probably know that. Sometimes a fashion icon, but maybe not. Okay, that's, that's enough on me. Let's talk about what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about what are streams. We're gonna talk about console-based streams. We're gonna talk about redirection of said streams. We're gonna talk about PowerShell-based streams. And we're gonna have, at the end, a call to action. We're gonna talk about some preferences. And then we'll have some points to ponder. All right, so let's talk about what streams are. We need a good definition for streams in order to understand what we're talking about. A stream is an interconnected input and output communication channels between a program and its environment. Now that sounds like a definition, and you'd be right because I took it from Wikipedia. I don't actually talk like that. But console streams, so we've got console streams, we're gonna to get to PowerShell streams, but we're gonna talk about console streams first because that's what people are used to. Linux stream, command processor streams, they have standard input, also abbreviated STDIN. You'll see that a lot in, in standard computer wares. You have standard output. It's the stuff that you see usually. And you have standard error for controlling and capturing the errors. And again, I've got the abbreviations on there. So here, is a low resolution, terrible diagram that I also stole because, you know, that's what you do on the internet. You steal stuff, right? So what you have over here is you have a keyboard and as you're typing on the keyboard, that's all going into the command processor's standard in. And then what you're seeing from what you're typing is coming through on standard out. So you type some stuff like uh, get child item if you're in PowerShell or if you're in command, you do uh, DIR, if you're in Unix, you're doing LS and you wanna see what's in the directory you're in. And so you press enter and you see it. But let's say you did LS, DIR or GCI or whatever you're using, and you're trying to look up a folder that doesn't exist. Well, you may get an error and the error is gonna come in the standard error stream. And that will also show up on the display. Notice the two arrows go to the display. All right, that's console-based streams. Uh, by the way, I tend to go pretty fast. I'm trying to keep an eye over here on the side for the chat. So if you have questions, you, know, you can slap them in the chat. And Andrew, if I blast right past them, hopefully you can see the chat. If not, someone get my attention uh, so we can, we can have a dialogue on that. Um, first question, so this is console-based, not PowerShell-specific? That's correct. These streams are console-based, not PowerShell-specific. The PowerShell streams have more options, and we're going to get to that. Okay. Redirection. Redirection is important. Redirection is what you call it when you tell a stream where to go twice, right? Because you're redirecting it. I know that joke's kind of a stretch, but I thought I'd throw it in here anyway, because, you know, I like terrible jokes. It's a joke. You only have to tell a stream where to go one time. So if you do something like this, you say two greater than ampersand one, that will redirect the error stream into the success stream. If you've done anything with streams before, especially in Linux, then you know, hey, I need to capture my streams. And so I'm gonna send the error stream into the success stream. Typically you see this when you wanna capture the output to a log and you wish to send the success and failure messages into one file because it combines two and one into one stream. I have never used redirection. Now, of course, 
I say I've never used redirection when, and I, I, the truth is, I yeah, I've used redirection, but usually only on other people's code. And the reason is because I follow the proper use of the streams in my code, rendering redirection unnecessary. Now I'm going to caveat this because exceptions exist. Exceptions almost always exist, and we need to be prepared for handling said exceptions. For example, I think it's if you do get dash dash version, the output that you see from that actually goes into the error stream. So if you want to capture that in one of your uh, one of your scripts and you say, hey, I need to get the version and I want to capture it in the log, then you're going to have to redirect the error stream because the version command will only show up in the error stream. OK. Um, kind of covered that pretty well. But if you want to know more about redirection, here is a link. Now, this presentation will be online. And so all these links that don't look like links, because thank you, Edge, this is how we do things now, you'll be able to click on those. But if you do search for about redirection PowerShell in the Microsoft Docs, then you'll get more details. And they have lots of good information about redirection. All right. I don't want to talk about all that console stuff because we're PowerShell people. I even have PowerShell on my shirt, see? So we're PowerShell people, and therefore PowerShell is greater than command.exe. PowerShell has more streams than the standard console. In fact, it has six streams. The right commandlets from the Microsoft PowerShell utility send data to these streams, and we're going to cover which ones they go into and how to use them. This is how you control the output into the streams. And it's time to jump into the streams with both feet because I like jokes that really make a splash. I keep waiting, like everyone's gone on mute, so I don't hear the groans. Oh, it's sad. Let's talk about the success stream. This is stream number one, also known as the output stream or the success pipeline. You'll hear these terms thrown around a lot, and they're pretty much interchangeable. This is what is displayed by the console, or excuse me, in the console by default. So when you do something in PowerShell and you get content back, that's the output stream. It comes from out host. Hold up now. Out host, because you guys have been paying attention, is not a write command. That is correct. Outpost is automatically appended to every PowerShell command. So if you do a command, even though you haven't put it in there, outpost is added onto it by the command processor. Okay. Outpost, interesting enough, has one parameter, one. And the parameter is paging. Thus, you can use pipe outpost paging to get more. Because then it'll page, right? However, I find it faster to type pipe more, plus I'm more familiar with more something. Did you say you wanted more? More? Well, I'll give you more, more. More in Windows PowerShell is actually a function with a single parameter, which is kind of weird. So if you do git command more, and you pipe that into select and you expand the script block, you'll see what I'm talking about. So more calls more.com to return more unless you pass paths, then more will get the content of the paths to pass to more.com, resulting in more content for more.com to more against. Hope you followed all that. Some people might just say to more on. More, it's, it's really tough not hearing the audience. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, more in PowerShell 7 is more.com application. So let's take a moment. Let's just, while I'm trying to recover from my terrible jokes, uh, let's go take a look at that because it's actually pretty interesting. Let me open up because I didn't have it already. Uh, Windows PowerShell here, and I'll blow up the font so we can all see it. And I'll type what I typed before. So you do get command more. And you get that. Well, that's not very helpful because what we want to see is the script. So what you can do is you can do select. And this is where I wanted to mention that 
I abbreviate like a maniac on the prompt, but in my code, it's full commands, full parameters, no positionals every time, no aliases. Uh, script block, and let's see what this looks like. So there it is. So you have your one parameter and it takes paths and um, the output encoding says, all right, put it to the system console. And if it's the path, go through each file in paths and do the get content of the file and pipe that to more.com, as you can see. Otherwise, just take the input and put it to more.com. So that's PowerShell 5, Windows PowerShell. Let's do the same command, get command, more. Hey, look, I already have it here. Yay, lucky me. Script block cannot be found. Hmm, that's interesting. Why? Let's go take a look at what this is. Get command more. That's because it's actually an application. So PowerShell 7 is not wrapping it into a script. It's just running more.com. Okay. Back to the presentation. Um, all right, I just did this. So that's get command more. Success streams via write output. So write output is how you get your information into the success stream, which is still stream number one. So write output sends the specified objects to the next command in the pipeline. Now we already know that it, if there isn't a pipeline, it sends to out default, which is added to the very end of every pipeline. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Before, a couple slides ago, I just said it goes to out host. What is out default doing in here, right? I said out host is automatically added. Well, it is, but out default actually comes before out host and out host is automatically prepended onto every command. It, out default eval evaluates whether there is a registered view for the object type being passed. So when you're doing things like um, git process, there is a registered view for the standard output for git process. It gives you those five or seven columns, I forget how many columns there are, with all those custom headers on top of the columns. So you can see all the process information if you're familiar with Git process. That comes from out default where it goes and looks for the custom view. And, and it shows you, you know, here's how I should be displayed and et cetera. If you don't have a custom view, then out default then hands off to out host, which is automatically prepended, uh, excuse me, appended. I use the right words, appended. Since outpost is added by out default automatically, write output passes the objects across the non specified pipeline to out default, checks for the formatters, and then adds the relevant types to pass to out host, which will write those objects to the console. I think I've said that again, but I want to make sure I cover my bullet items properly. If you want to know even more about how all this fun stuff works and where I got a lot of this information, here is the link for how formatting and outputting really works. But just suffice it to say, when you want something to go to the console, use write output. Uh, Andrew, how do you click the link? You can't click the link on the presentation, obviously, but this presentation will be made available. It's going to be up on GitHub, and so then you can get it from there. Now that I've said all that, and I've gone through this over the river and through the woods version of how text visible actually shows up in the console, I'm not gonna tell you, don't use write output. Seriously, don't use write output. But you're now confused and saying, I don't understand why. It's because it's slow. It doesn't actually add any value to your code or your processing. What it does add is another step. Now it's super fast, so you're not going to notice it, but all it does is wrap command let write object, which is already called by default when outputting to the success stream. So all these defaults are all happening. What does write output do for you? Nothing. Also, don't use write output because Mark Krauss knows better than we do. Now, for those of you that have been in PowerShell and been around PowerShell, you understand what contributions Mark Krauss has made. And so he wrote this blog that says, let's kill write output. I'll give you one bullet point that I'd agree with back from my time where, I, I, let me restate that because it sounded like I don't agree with everything. I agree with everything he put in the doc, in his blog. One of the points I wanna highlight at this time, one of which is when I was in digital security, 
you can actually do an alias for write output. So then when someone's code is running along and it pipes to route, write output, if you have managed to payload your write output alias in there, it'll run the alias first before going to the write output commandlet. And then you can redirect data to nefarious locations. So write output isn't actually protecting you from anything. You just want to send your content directly onto the success stream. Any questions about that? I'm looking at the chat to see because no one's talking. Nope. OK, rolling on because I keep on rolling. Uh, should you question comes in, should you just put to a string and let it output? I tell you what, Andrew, when I get to the code, I'll show you what you should do. OK, we'll come back to this. Now we're moving on to stream number two, which is the error stream. OK, error stream. Thank goodness the error stream is easy, right? Errors that occur in the console will go to the error stream and be stored in the dollar error variable in reverse order. So the last one in is the first one in the error variable array. But how do these errors get in there? OK, so the error stream gets in there via the write error command. Write error will send a non-terminating error to the error stream and will also store the error in the dollar error variable. The dollar error variable just sucks up all of the errors all the time. So anytime you put anything into the error stream, it automatically goes into the error variable. If you want it in after write error, then you need to code this action because the write error is a non-terminating error. Now me, I like to catch any errors with a try catch block and then either use write error followed by return or use throw to write the error and then end processing. So what is the difference between write error and throw? Write error is non-terminating, throw is terminating. That's really the main difference between the two. Both send their output to the error stream and they also send it to the error variable. Ooh, demo time. Okay, let's see what we got for a demo. Sure hope that played. Let's get over to the code. So here's right error. Oop, you know what? I had a right output example that I skipped as my demos. I told you not to use right output. There's your demo for right output. All right, now let's talk about right error. Let's get to the demo code. So here's all the code is what we're going to run. Uh, I think I should just hit F5 and talk through this. OK, here we go. Interesting enough, one of the things I put in here is wait debugger, so it stops. I don't have to go in and, and um, press F9 and stop in the debugger. Also, wait debugger works in the console. So if you're going through and you're, you're wanting your code to stop at a particular location so that you can debug it, I recommend using wait debugger. All right, I'm going to press F11 to get rolling through this. All right, I guess it pops up on screen. Are you using a screen reader to operate VS Code? No, go away. So we're going to go to the demo error function that I've written. So here's demo error. First thing it's going to do is it's going to try to do a get item on the number one. That is an error. OK, so now you can see in the console I've got down here, it says get item, had an error on line two. Uh, Character three, get item one, there it is. I cannot find path one because it does not exist. That's it. So I've got it on screen. And now if I do this, dollar error zero, I'll get the most recent one. And it's exactly that same error. OK, so now let's do get item two for our example number two. Now, what just happened there? I had a try catch block. It did not go to the catch block. OK, you saw that. That was that. 
Now it jumps down to 11. Here's a different try catch block. Notice that this one, forget item, has error action stop. And so what that's doing is that's saying get item has an error. If it has an error, I want you to stop because this one here up on line five, what it did was get item throws non-terminating errors. So it's going to keep going. Now you don't want get item or get child item to throw terminating errors because then if you did a uh, get child item or yeah, get child item on a directory where some of the files underneath you don't have access to, you don't want your code to stop and die because it came across an error. You don't want a terminating error. You want a non-terminating error. But here I'm now telling it for my error action, I want you to stop. Okay, so now see it went right into the catch block. And so now I'm going to get right error item three not found. Now remember the error that I got up here on item number one, or actually you can see it here on item number two here. It says, here's my error, get item two. When I press this and I press F11 and see that, now I'm getting item not found because I'm telling the error, I'm telling it what information I want to go into the error stream, and that's also the information that then goes into the error variable. Okay, I want you to notice one other thing that I find interesting about this. Notice that this error is on line five. Notice that this error is on line 38. Because I'm telling it right error is the output I'm wanting to get from this demo. And so when you do that, it's not going to tell you exactly the line where the error showed up. It's going to return that the function has returned an error. Okay. I'm hoping that's clear. It it throw it may throw you off initially, but I wanted to explain it to make sure you you, you kind of got the gist of that. Question. What What's the benefit of non-terminating errors? Do we always want errors to terminate? Okay. I think I'll cover that now. I think, believe I covered that in the slides, but I'm, I'm gonna tell you to you now since that was the question. Terminating errors can be a little tricky. So they, when you hit a terminating error, code stops, you're done. The get AD commandlets, specifically some of the set AD commandlets, do terminating errors. And terminating errors do not honor error action or error action preference. And so that makes them tricky to work with because they will do what I might consider unusual behavior. Most of the commandlets that I've interacted with in PowerShell are non-terminating. And so what I wind up doing is I just assume they either are terminating which error action stop won't do anything, or they're non-terminating, and then error action stop will uh, control how they act. And then I put them in a try catch block. That way I'm guaranteeing that my code is doing what I expect it to do. So then if this command get item here um, terminates, even if it's an, excuse me, if it throws an error, even if it's a non-terminating error, it'll go into the catch block. If the command that I'm doing does throw terminating errors, it will also go into the catch block. Andrew, did I cover that pretty well? Any reason to, uh, another question from Drew, any reason not to use throw over error action stop when terminating? Yes, because error action stop is actually controlling the command and after that is when you would do the throw because throw is a different action. Hope that made sense. Um, any, I see I'm checking for any other questions. Okay, got it, good. Let me continue on through this next demo for get item four with error action stop. And I wanna show you what this does. So we're gonna run that, can't find four, goes to stop, goes to the catch, so it does write error. This time I'm gonna say write error dollar underscore. So instead of giving it custom, I'm just saying, take whatever error you got from the pipeline and pump it into write error. So we'll see that. Notice it is still line 38. 
But this time I got the full error that came from that, which is cannot find path, does not exist. And then I'm doing a return. Now notice on this one, return, then goes to finally. It didn't actually return because I'm in a try catch finally block. And so now I'm gonna write host end of demo error function with color magenta. There we go, got my text, okay. And now I'm at the end of demo error. Now I wanna show you what demo throw does because someone said throw, we should do throw. Let's see what throw does. In other words, we're gonna start at the top and we're gonna throw down or something. Get item number five, error action stop, throw dollar underscore. By the way, this is my preferred method of doing the errors, okay? Throw dollar underscore, goes to the finally, right host, end of the demo throw function. Anybody notice anything happen to my VS code? It has now stopped processing. Okay, before I could, I could continue on through the code, when it hit the throw, it's done. My code is not done. I still have more to run. This has not run. Okay, now I've got a little note here to say, run by highlighting and do F8. You may run into this as well. So here's me standing on the wall warning you that uh, there be monsters over there. I want you to watch this. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna press F8 on this. Oh, you know what? I did that, but I need it to step through. Actually, I don't need it to step through because it did the same thing. I would like to, to step through, but I want you to see this. Where's this line? Not there. Actually, it happened up here. Did it? It does weird stuff. Let's do this again. I'm gonna give us little lines here. I'm gonna run this. It actually put end of demo throw function ahead of the throw. So by doing it this way versus inside a function, you may get some you may get some unusual results. But I did want to show that when you do throw, it stops processing and does not continue on. Where if you do the right error and return, it continues processing. Okay. That's the end of right error demo. Uh, any additional questions? I didn't see any. So on we go. Back to the slides. Um, I, yep, I had a slide, terminating versus non-terminating. So I'm gonna blow through this pretty quickly since I kind of talked through it already. Terminating errors do not continue running the code. Non-terminating errors do return the error, but continue running the code. So we've seen that. That's the difference between uh, some of those set um, AD user commands and the get child item. Error action preference and error action parameter only work on non-terminating errors, okay? I wanted to say that again because that's so important. So if you're getting weird results from your errors, that's probably why. Thus, if you're using a commandment that has a terminating error, you must use try catch block to keep from returning this error because it will not honor error action parameter or the error action preference. So Stephen's best practice is go ahead and put everything you think might throw an error that you want to control the output into a try catch block. Okay. Let's talk about some error stream best practices. That's a good thing. Errors are for displaying something that has failed. Seems a little obvious, but I've seen people do some weird things with error messaging. Also, do not set error equal to null. Now, I looked at this and said, oh, you know what? I put the null at the end. So the, um, the PS script analyzer, I about froze for a second. The PS script analyzer, analyzer would look at that and put the little yellow squiggly under it and go, hey, you're supposed to put null at the front. Anyway, don't set error to null and clear out all the errors. It's abusive to your users to remove errors that they may have needed without their consent. So don't put that into your script, okay? Also, don't change the error action preference in your script or in the console for the same reason you don't wanna be clearing things out. 
And for this one, I say, come at me, bro. I've already shown you that you do error action. If you can put stop on them. And that's what I'm recommending that you do for terminating errors and to control the non-terminating errors instead. Now I will grant, and I have to give my caveats because everything, there, there are almost no hard, fast rules. I'll grant that if you're writing a function, setting error action preference to stop will only change the function scope and not the script or console scope. So it is somewhat safe. And I do approve that, although I'm not crazy about it. I like to control where my errors might come up. And so that's just Stephen's preference, okay? Yep, thanks, David. Um, do not change the color of write error text. I've seen people do this. Do not do that. I am going to say, come at me, bro, on this one too, because errors are red. We're used to things being bad when you see red. Don't change the color of the text. You may like it. Everyone else who's trying to understand what your code is doing is not going to be excited about that. This is a standard. Please don't modify standards. Do think of the children. Okay. A lot of error stream stuff. What's next? How about the warning stream? Now we're outside of what consoles do and command processors do. We're now into super duper PowerShell stuff. Now PowerShell has been doing other things in the success stream and the error stream, but now we're looking at warning streams. Warning messages aren't failures. I've seen people use write warning to put error content on the screen. They're not errors. These things are not failures. They're warnings, okay? It is important enough to show an interactive user information they need to know that may cause a problem. And that's what the warning's for. It can be used to prompt the user to see if they want to continue processing, okay? That's another little trick you can do with warning stream. I'm going to show that in the demo. We're going to cover that. Where you might see a warning message, anyone work with the Azure commandlets? AZ module commandlets give warning information on upcoming breaking changes to the commandlets. For example, the AZ public IP address. That one will say, hey, things are going to change. You're using this. So it'll put a warning text in there. Okay. The warning stream via write warning. So write warning is how you get things into the warning stream. Every bit of content that goes into the warning stream, when it's displayed on console, it prepends the message with the stream name. I'm going to do that in the demo so you can see it. It doesn't require a setting change or a parameter to display. That's kind of nice. And you can change the information action to continue. I don't know why I put that in there, because continue isn't the right word. I think that's supposed to be inquire. All right, we're going to get into the demo and check it. I, I think I've got a typo there that doesn't quite make sense to my head. All right, let's go in here and get to the next one. All right, I'm going to give you a VS Code tip at this time, too. Over here on Explorer, if you click these ellipses and you do open editors, you can now see all the stuff you have open, and then you don't have to figure out up here on the top where you are. It comes in a nice scrollable ordered list over here. I like that. Okay, here's our stuff. I got region set up. Don't pre-read my joke. That's cheating. I should have collapsed that. I'm gonna press F5 and we're gonna start in our demo. First thing we get to is good old wait debugger. All right, let's step through. We're gonna run the demo warning function and the demo warning function is going to say, write warning question. What is our question? Warning, why is no one afraid of the Ning tribe attacking? Everyone knows it's just a warning and nothing to be afraid about. Oops, I even flubbed my punchline. Okay, the thing I want you to pay attention to here is that when it did write warning, it put the warning text on the beginning. That's baked in, okay. Now we're going to look at another function. This one is inquire continue. Okay. 
So let's see what this looks like. Now, here's an interesting thing that's going to happen that I'm going to point out to you. As I'm stepping through this, notice that I've done right host and I've mixed up the colors. Okay. The reason I've done that is because I like to do this. It's fun. But look at the janky output that I get when I'm debugging it. Now I've got a press over there on the left. Now I get a Y in a different color. And now I get the rest of it. It's kind of weird, but that's just how this works. Now let's pay attention to the right warning message. Right warning message, do you want more dad jokes? Notice the warning action inquire on here. So I'm gonna press F11 and I get the prompt. Do you want to continue on? Now, every time I ran through this, it seemed like on my, my um, tests that I, when I was setting this up, this line was still highlighted. I have to be sure and click here, otherwise I screw up my code. I don't wanna screw that up. So I'm gonna press Y for yes, and we want to continue. And now I'm continuing on. This is a good way to, if you've got a warning that you consider serious enough, but it's not an error, that you wanna interrupt your code for your users, you can have warning action inquire and it'll ask them, hey, what do you wanna do here? Well, I said, I wanna continue. And so this thing says, okay, as you wish, continue on. But what about this? Let's take a look at this one. So it's basically the same. Now, here's another example I wanna give you as far as tips go. Notice how each one of my little functions here that I've got doing these various things, they're all wanting to say, what do you wanna press next? Since the code would be the same for 26, 27, and 28 up here for both demo warning inquire halt catch and demo warning inquire halt, I wrote a function to do those for me, which I called which key to press. And now I pass it key press H. So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna press F11. It jumps up here into my built-in function or my inline function that is. My parameters key to press. Now it's gonna do the same crazy thing here because I'm stepping through, but you kind of get the gist of it. Now it goes back to the other one. And my what key was I supposed to press this time? I was supposed to press H. So we'll do this. You want to do this? Yes. You jump down here to the terminal because I like keystrokes. That way you keep your hand off the mouse. I'm going to say halt. Notice that's in a try catch. It says write warning as you wish. Return. Finally. Exiting. And we're out of here. Why did I put that in a try catch? The reason I put that in try catch because I wanted to show you what happens if you don't put it in a try catch and someone halts. So we're going to do the same thing. Oh, I just messed up. I meant to do F10 on that one so that it didn't go through this again. Uh, yeah, see, I even had wait debugger there so I could catch it. I messed up. Oh, well. Presentation fails always occur. So here I'm going to do the same thing. This time I'm gonna press, oops, oh, huh, that one. And one mistake and then they start to cascade. Back over to right warning. Here we go, gonna click, gonna press H, press enter. Look what it did. When I did that, it actually threw an error. And when it threw an error, Anyone want to guess whether that's a terminating or a non-terminating error? Because it's done. It just quit. So things to pay attention to, if you're going to do the right warning action inquire and you expect that someone might halt, you probably want to put that in a try catch and control the output. Or if you don't care, just have it throw an error and you're done. Okay. All right. I'm going to look over here, see if there's any et cetera. Question. Can you remind me of the method you're using to step through each line of code individually? Yes. Let me hit F5 here because F5 is the same as going up here and clicking run. I like to press the keys because it's faster and more accurate. A uh, question? Okay, thought I heard someone. So right here, as I'm stepping through, if you want to step 
let me press this. If you want to run this code and you want to see all the details of it, you press F11 and it go. this is what's known as step into. And so see, now it goes to demo warning and I keep pressing F11, F11, and it just goes one, one right after another. Okay, now I'm gonna do this one different. For this one, I'm gonna press F10. And what F10 does is it's called step over. So it's gonna run this function and just go to the next one. So instead of stepping in and going through each one, you'll get to see that. Okay, so this one has the, this one's the one where you're supposed to continue. So I'm gonna do the continue. I'm gonna do the same thing here, except this time I'm gonna press F5 because I want to, I want it to just keep going. And so this one's the halt and catch example. So I say H and it goes on. And notice because I pressed F5, it went right onto the demo warning and went right onto this key press. And now it stopped here because I said, hey, I want to stop here in my presentation or in my code. And now you get to see that here's my press H for this example all nice and colored and together, okay? And so now I'll press F5 to continue running, and that's how I use VS Code debugging. Oops, I'm supposed to answer. Halt and error down, okay? Sweet. That is right warning. I don't see any more uh, questions. Back to this. Oh, see, I left that out. I forgot about that. <laughs> All right, that's the last one. There's, there's not going to be any more of that. I forgot about that. All right, so let's talk about best practices here. Uh, sorry, Drew. Use warnings like other commandlets do. So you want something to do the warnings, um, like the AZ commandlets, like give the information, but it's not a crisis. It's not an error. It's just something they need to know about because something bad could happen or something's going to change in the future. Uh, give important information. It's not worthy of stopping the execution, but you know, it's also not something you want to go into the error variable because you may need that information in the error, error variable to be clean. And it you don't want it to increase the error count because technically, again, we're talking about something that's not an error. Now let's talk about the verbose stream. Let me catch my breath. Give additional, additional information, but only when requested. I love the verbose stream. Use of write verbose requires your code to be an advanced function. So I'm going to explain what an advanced function is, but just know you have to have an advanced function in order for write verbose to work. There's two ways to make your code an advanced function. One is you add commandlet binding to your script. This is what everybody knows. This is what you're supposed to do. However, there's another way to do it. You can add parameter to any of the defined parameters and your code will function as if it's an advanced function. Okay, so here's a tangent on advanced function common parameters. So when a script becomes an advanced function, you get additional parameters and here's the list. Don't really want to read through all of these, but notice that each one of these also has an abbreviation. So you can do dash verbose, or you can do dash VB, dash debug, dash DB. Notice some of these we've already talked about. Here's error action, here's a warning action. Okay. But these are the ones that get added when your function becomes advanced. Please note that only verbose and debug switches match the right commandments. So so far. Of the ones we've talked about, we're now talking about verbose, but only verbose and debug have write commandments. All right, so verbose stream caveats. You can change the verbose preference to output the verbose stream content without the verbose switch or the code being an advanced function. Okay, I don't recommend this. Now, I've seen people do this a lot, and they have valid reasons for it for their use case. I say, don't do that, okay? You can add the verbose switch to the right verbose command to return the output. That's basically what you're doing. Again, don't change verbose preference 
stick to the verbose switch. Okay. Uh, why? Please don't do that either. I don't like either one of these. Verbose has a purpose. It's to give additional information, but when you're usually running or you're normally running your code, to not output this information. Okay. That's why I say don't do that. Again, caveats, preferences. I'm just giving you Steven's opinion on that. Uh, question showed up. Should we handle verbose preference and error action preference in a similar way? Should they be treated differently? Okay, verbose preference and error action preference are both um, top level built in variables. You can change them within the scope of a function or script scope as long as the script scope is inside a function scope. But if you're changing it at the highest level, then all of your code from that point on will honor those preferences. OK, that's risky because what if you forget and then code after this code? So code A changes the error action preference, uh, the verbose preference, error action preference, either any of those preferences. And then code B runs and behaves differently because the preferences have been changed. I always leave the preferences at their defaults. That way the output, the results are always predictable. And then inside my functions, I, I like to stay away from the preference. I just do the action choices. Okay. Let's see. Write verbose. So use that when you want to give a status of script updates. I like that. For example, when you're looping through a bunch of items, you want to see what item you're on. So the first time you're running your code, oops, and it, I'll just talk through this one. Uh, use this instead of write host for information only updates. So you're looping through 100 servers. And when you, when you write your code the first time, you don't use write verbose and you run it and it's going through and it's taking a while and you don't know what's happening. And it's taking longer than you think it should and you still don't know what's happening. And now you're getting nervous because it's taking way too long. So you control C and now you're out of your script. Problem is you don't know where it fit. So then go in and put a write verbose statement in there inside your loop and say, write verbose, I'm on this step. And so then when you run it, you run your code again and you do the dash verbose parameter. So now you can see, oh, I'm on this step and it's gonna fill up your console with a bunch of extra stuff, but you're gonna know where you are on your code. It's great for debugging, but then when you ship it off to your standard user to use it, they don't have to have that because they don't need to see all that. Okay. Now, here's an opinion. Again, Stephen's presentation, Stephen gives you lots of opinions. When to use write verbose versus write host. You consider your user's experience. Okay. Don't let your users think your code is not working. So don't send them into a long loop without any information showing up. Or don't put some kind of, or do put some kind of text in there that says the next step may take a while. Please be patient. That's a smart thing to do in your script. Okay. Based on how long a particular step takes, it may be more helpful to use write host. So then you're guaranteeing whether they use the verbose switch or not, write host is going to put the text onto the console so you can see what they're doing. Okay. Demo time. Sorry, Drew. No text on this one. Oops, I was supposed to switch over. Then we'll come back to the best practices. All right, write verbose. Yay, here we go. We're just going to jump right into it. Wait, debugger, F11. I probably don't have to say F11 because it shows up on screen, but I do it anyway. All right, first function. We have more questions and answers. Are you ready for this one? <laughs> I am. Um, why do action-oriented operating systems return so much data? I'm running an object-oriented operating system. What about action-oriented operating systems? It's because they are verb OS. <laughs> uh, it reads better than it says, but whatever. Anyway, here you go. Just like warning, you get verbose colon space on the beginning of all the entries that show up on screen. 
Okay, and all I'm doing is the right verbose, I'm passing it text. Oh, by the way, <laughs> I did want to show this. Let me open this up. Ha ha, those of you that uh, might find my code and try to read it, there's your answer. No cheating. My joke punchlines are hidden from you. I thought that was clever. Whatever. Back to the presentation. Um, now, here's what we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to do the redirection. Now, I showed you already how to redirect error stream in Linux or console based things. But what we're doing here is we're going to say, take, give me verbose output, but take the contents of stream four, which is the verbose stream, and go into verbose text. All right, so let's see what that looks like. It's exactly the same function as before. Here's your question. Here's your answer. Where's my text? Okay, notice nothing showed up on screen. Keep going. Get content verbose text. There it is. Okay, I redirected four into the text file and it did not show up on screen. All right, we'll do this one more time, but this time we're gonna say advanced function mode enabled. So I'm, I'm changing gears just a little bit, so hold with me. Look at nine through 14 and 16 through 22 again, and notice this one has commandlet binding, and this one does not, but it has parameter. And I did this just to show, yes, this does honor the advanced commandment modes. Okay. All right. That is verbose. Let's see if there's any other questions about that. Don't see any. Wowing ahead. Let's talk about verbose stream best practices. Use right verbose where you typically use inline comments. I like doing that. A lot of places where you have the pound character and you're saying what part of the code or what part of your function you're in, like here's where we get all the computer names. Put a right verbose there instead of that hashtag. And so then when someone does dash verbose on your function, they'll actually see it on screen. Here's where we get all the computer names. Super useful. Again, more art than science. Find out what works for you. See what you like. Don't annoy your users, okay? Don't put so much stuff in there that it's just, it hides the content because you're being so verbose. We've got another stream for that and we're about to get to it. Don't flood your users or yourself with useless information. Do give relevant feedback. All right, rolling on. Debug stream, this is the one that is for me at least not very used. I don't use this one very much. That's what I'm trying to say. What this does is it gives debug information, but only when requested. So like verbose, you have to do dash debug in order to see the debug information, see the contents from the debug stream. Now this bullet says, I've never used this stream, okay? And the debug stream goes back to PowerShell 2.0. I couldn't find out if debug was in 1.0. The reason I put bullet number two on here that says I've never used this stream is because at the time I wrote this slide, I hadn't. But now I'm going to try to explain to you why and where you'd want to use it. Okay. Once integrated scripting environments became available, they replaced the need for the debug stream for interactive evaluation. That is the key, interactive evaluation. If you're running your code in non-interactively, like you have it scheduled and you're running it out of the task scheduler, you may need full information on an object that you would use the debug stream to get that you because you just you don't have it, but you don't want to fill up your log files necessarily or fill up your um your what sort I'm looking for your error log. You don't want to fill that up with a bunch of extraneous data. So you want to be able to turn on debug and you want to be able to turn it off and decide how much of the data you get, okay? That's what it's for. So the debug stream gets written to via write debug. You use it whenever you want to send debug information. 
It's similar to write verbose and functionality in that you have to do dash debug for it to work. And let's go check out a demo. You know what's in this demo, don't you? Come on now, you know what's in this demo. Questions and answers. We're gonna do demo debug one and we're passing it the debug parameter. See, in case I didn't close region, I hid my answer so you can't see it. <laughs> All right, Andrew says he's ready to facepalm because this one has facepalm on it. Uh, notice this one command that binding, it has to be advanced in order for debug to work. Write debug, here's your question. Notice it says debug. What did one developer say to the other when they increased logging and found the error? It's debug. You know, I can almost hear the face palm from here. <laughs> okay. We're gonna do something similar that we did over in verbose is we're gonna put five into debug text. And so you can see it basically honors the exact same thing. Here's your question, here's your answer. You don't see anything in the in the uh, console, in the terminal down below, because we've redirected it into the text. Here's the text, just as I said. All right, let's look at demo two, or debug two. This one's a little different, because this is where I wanted to show, this is how you use it. All right, again, commandlet binding parameter. We're gonna get all of the PS1 files that are currently in the script root, and we're gonna pipe that into file info, okay? And then for each one of these, we're gonna loop through them. So we process this, and then we debug this, and it goes to the next one, and it goes to the next one, and it goes to the next one. There's no output. Why did we not get any output? Now I'm gonna press F5 to jump us back to where we were so that we can see why we're not getting any output. Because if you weren't paying attention, and I went through pretty fast, and I tend to talk pretty fast, here's what it ran. It just ran the code. Okay, that was it. Now we're going to run it again, but this time we're going to say, give me verbose output. Okay, so it goes in, gets the file list for each item, gets the right verbose, and now we see that it's processing this file. We do debug, we get nothing because I didn't pass it debug. All right, let's continue on. I'm gonna press F5 and it gives us the list of files and now we're back to here. This time we're gonna do verbose and debug. Let's watch what happens here. File info for each item, we get the verbose, we get the verbose info, ta-da, the debug. Now what's, what, what am I sending to debug? I'm sending it the item, I'm saying select all objects for that item, pipe it to out strings because it needs string in order to write to debug. And here's what we get, whammo. Okay, I'm gonna maximize this for just a second so we see it, we can see it all. Lots of text. Again, this is what debug is for. You say somewhere in my code, this object is not doing what I think it should be, but I can't see the object because it's running on a remote system. I need to give it the, flat, the dash debug command and I've coded it so that I will see the object. And so now I can see it. That's what that's intended for. Now I'm gonna press F5 and we're gonna blast through the rest of these. Woo. There's a bunch. All right, now finally, I'm gonna write the, the content out to a debug because you may want debug to go into a different log file so that you can see it and you can deal with it later, but it also doesn't fill up your standard log file, okay? Again, I keep saying log file. This is kind of stuff you should be doing. You should be doing this. All right, I'm gonna just press F5 so it fills up. Brr. Okay, uh, let's see. I think I forgot to put in here to go get that content, so we might as well do it here. Actually, I'm gonna do it over here. I'm just gonna click on it because this is debug. And here's all of the files with all of the content. Okay. You don't see any questions on debug. Debug's pretty advanced. You use it when you need it. Um, but this is that's that's what it's for. Okay. 
saw the demo. Let's talk about some best practices for the debug stream. Use VS Code or ISC to debug your code. Okay, don't try to debug it by putting a ton of write debugs into your code and try to get that out, but that's too much. It's just way too much. Use VS Code or ISC while you're doing interactive debugging. Okay, seriously, not a joke. Shoot, I'm starting to sound like the president. Uh, unless you need to get non-interactive data and you need the full object data output for review. So again, if you're doing a task manager type thing and you're, you're scheduled task, and not task manager, scheduled task, you schedule it on a remote system and it's running, but you're not getting the output you think you should, and then you go modify it to do dash debug so that you can see it. All right, here we are at stream number six. Said we had six streams. Here's stream number six, the information stream. This is the new one that they added in PowerShell 5, stop killing puppies. Stop the killing puppies thing is the old Don Jones trope where he says every time someone uses right host, uh, it kills a puppy. Now we don't have to worry about that because it's all handled by the information stream. It allows the capturing of informational messages. Right host output cannot be captured. That's why you need information stream. And yes, I know about start transcript. Please don't use start transcript. Please don't tell me you're using start transcript. Uh, transcript is a hack and I avoid it. One more time. Come at me, bro. All right. By default, write information doesn't write anything. What? The information preference for write information is set to silently continue by default. So if you do write information, it's not going to give you any information. You need to capture the output using the information variable, okay? And then change information action to continue, and then you'll see it. Demo time. And you know what's in the demo because it's been in most of the other ones, questions and answers, we love them. Let's see where we're at. Uh, F5 is where we need to be at. Ooh, I think I just went out of full view. Hold on. I pressed F11 too soon. Go back to full screen. There we go. F5. It's the danger of the keystrokes if you get out of order. All right. Demo info one. Get child item PS right. Now, this one's got a little bit of extra in here. So we're going to see this. So there's all the PS, or excuse me, all of the files with the word write with dashes on both sides of the word in it. There's our information. Now we say write information question with information action continue. If you only do, I'm going to try and do this where I highlight it. If you only do this part, write information question, I'm going to press F8 so it runs just the highlighted code. Now, see, I thought that was going to put out nothing, but I think I messed up because it output information. What are we doing here? This thing is making me look silly, right? Information question. <laughs> I always love it when a. I I always love it when something goes crazy. Information preference, silently continue. Hmm, I'm gonna have to learn something because that is not doing what I thought it was supposed to do. It may be because I'm already in the debug of the code that it's doing that. Let me jump over to here and do that again. Work D, no right, information, Text, I'm gonna leave off information action. That's what it's supposed to do. That's what it does by default, silently continue. I don't know what's happening over here in code. That's That was freaking me out. Okay. Let's get back to my joke. I'm much more comfortable when I'm telling my terrible jokes. Why does military parade data look so orderly? Because it's in formation. Come on. I feel like that error kind of screwed up my joke rhythm and mojo. Whatever. Anyway. Ugh. 
Thank you. Sorry, Thank that was you. delayed because somebody muted me. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Let's, let's, so what I'm going to do next here is we're going to pipe the contents of demo one into the results. Now, remember what demo, well, I'll just show you. What demo one does is it does get child item and then it gives you your information. Now that just printed out the screen that just printed out the screen. And now we're back to here. Results did not print the screen because results was capturing this, what goes into the success stream from demo one. Okay. Now we're going to take a look at this by piping results into Git member and select the type name. What is it? It's file info because that's what it returned. So now if we look at the results, we get the results. All right, so let's do the same thing, but this time let's send six into information text and see what that looks like. Same demo. I probably should have just pressed F5 for this. And now we go look at information text and information text has the joke information in it. But where the demo info go? Well, the demo already played out. It already put all the content out for the uh, get child item. Okay, so that's what happened there. All right, one more demo. This time, notice we've got six redirecting to ampersand one. So now we're taking six and we're pushing the results from success, excuse me, the information stream, which is stream six, into the success stream for this one. So let's see what this looks like. So here we go. Here's the command. Didn't get any output on that one. Here's this one. Didn't get any output on that one. Not on that one either. So what's happening? Well, because it all piped into the results variable. Now, if we look at results, we have two types in there. This is not necessarily a good thing because now you've got blended types into your objects or blended objects into your variable. I think that's a better way to say it. And finally, when you get the results, you get them all combined together. You get your file info objects and your, what was the name of those? Information record objects all combined together. Okay, got one more. We'll do demo two. What is demo two different than demo one? This is what I wanted to show you about right host. Here's our message text. Here's the info for which you asked. Notice my English grammar where I did not end in a preposition. Thank you, English teachers. Right host, message text, foreground, cyan. There you go. There's the info. Now I piped that into message one, and this may be new for some people that are new to PowerShell, but I told you that right host on the slides, I told you that right host cannot be captured. You can't capture that output. It's true, because if I now run message one, I get nothing. But instead of piping it into message one, it put it out onto the console. You can't capture this, okay? I wanted to prove it. So now the next one is, we're gonna do this with right information message text. Now let's look at message two. Still nothing. That's weird. But I showed you that before when I got freaked out by my presentation in that by default, right information does silently continue. So if you just put right information, it's not going to work. You need information action continue. And now you can see here's the info for which you asked. Now message four, we're going to take the output and we're going to pipe it into stream one. And now message four has the text in it as well. Finally, I got one more for good measure, I guess is the word. Write information, message text, information variable, message five. This is different. Notice this one is information action. This one is information variable. So what is it doing? It's taking whatever the text is and it's putting it into this information variable. Okay, so let's take a look at that. And now if I do dollar message five, I get the output. And that is the end of that demo. I don't see any questions on that one. I think I'm starting to, to get to the fatigue part of the presentation. So much information. All right. Sweet, we've covered the six. Let's talk about the information stream best practices. Use right host for colors. 
I use right host for colors. I like the colors. That's why I use it. Use right information if you need to capture the data. Okay, that's really it. Surprising. That's it. Right host for colors, right information to capture the data. The other cool thing I think I mentioned before, but I, it's not on this slide, use right host to guarantee that whatever you're trying to output gets seen by the console. Because right information may or may not, depending upon what someone has done to their PowerShell, right host almost every time writes it out. Okay, progress stream. The what now? Did you even know there was a progress stream? Because I told you there were six streams. If you were counting along, which I have been, this is number seven. The progress stream is used to communicate progress via a custom defined progress bar. Okay, now you know what it is. You've probably seen it, but it is an unnumbered stream. So technically it's not seven, but here it is anyway. Here's the other thing. Your output cannot be redirected. You cannot capture the output, pro I mean, excuse me, the progress stream. All right, progress stream via write progress. Well, how do you use it? You use a write command. Of course, that's what we're talking about. You use this when building a data may take a while. So I like to use this to, to say, hey, you're going to be at this thing a while while we're going out and looking at all these servers. Just chill. Here's a progress bar for you. Consider the user experience. Again, back to more art than science. All right, for this demo, you may be sad. I'm sorry. There's no jokes here. This is my one non-joke. But I did want to show you what I'm doing here. I say, if git host is not equal to console host for the git host name, then I use write warning. All right, so maybe you want this to happen in the console, I mean, in console host. So I'm just going to show you what this looks like. Here we go. Notice I'm kind of using the tips that I figured out or that I've been talking about before, where I say warning action inquire. And it says, hey, this demo works best from the console. See that? Do you want to continue? Well, I could, but I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to. I want to run it the way it says it works best from the console. All right. So I said halting is selected. Remember, try catch. So I don't give ugly error messages back to the users. All right. So let's step over here and run number seven directly. What is it doing? Well, it's running and basically it's just doing looped processing. We'll go back and look at the code in a second, but it's going through each one of these, okay? It's drawing one dot and then for every one dot at the beginning, it draws more dots and then more dots. Now, I don't know if you noticed because it went by pretty fast, but on my end, the text was flashing a lot and it was hopping up and down. Okay, it may not come across on the stream very well, but I want to, want to go back and look at the code. So it says for level one, it's one to three, and then it says write progress. Then it does level two and it's one to five and it does write progress for that one. And then it does one to six and write progress there as well. And then it says write host, put dot one pipe, oops, dot two pipe, <laughs> go away text, and then dot three. This is taken directly from example four in the help from write progress. Okay, the only thing that I've done is I updated the number of iterations and the delay time because the delay time they had was a little bit longer and I wanted this to flow through. Here's the problem with this particular solution that I've done here is write host is in the middle. So even though you get to see the stuff on screen as it's going through, which is handy, it doesn't look clean because it's hopping up and down and it's moving and the text, et cetera, et cetera. So here's what I've done. Here's what I've done. I told it to say, go into debug mode because I have another right debug in there. Okay, let me bop back over the code and show you. So we're now at this, we're now here. So what I've done now is I said, okay, create myself an output array. Here's a variable for level one. Here's a variable for level two. Here's a variable for level three. And finally, the one for sleep duration. By putting them up here, it makes it easy for me to make adjustments to this code as it's doing the same thing. Now I'm adding the output. Yes, I know this is 
not preferred. Don't do this in your code. This is a hack. Uh, you want to you want to actually add them to a proper library. Uh, is that right? Library. It's late. I'm getting tired. My words words be bad. Anyway, I'm I'm using this as a hack. And then finally at the end we get the output. So let's see what this looks like in the console. Now remember I did write debug. Here's a cool thing. You can say use H for help, and it'll tell you what your commands are. You can do step into, step over, just like you can in the console, except it's controlled by these characters. Here's a fun one. You can do list. I'm going to say L, and it'll tell us, here you are in the code. Here's what came before, and here's where you're going. Kind of like that. But for us, we're just going to do continue, and it's going to run. Now notice. I don't know if you can see it different than the other ones. It's not hopping up and down. It's not drawing. It's just plowing through these steps. Nice and neat. And then at the end, here's all your output. Cool. All right. That's right progress. Didn't see any questions on right progress. Right progress is pretty standard. All right. Here is the call to action. Thank goodness we are winding this sucker down. Use the action parameters to change how a commandlet responds. Okay, so error action. I've shown you this. Do that. It's going to change things. The default value for action is continue. I like to use set it to stop. Write the error to the error stream and keep on going. That's what it's going to do. Information action. Same thing. The default value for that is silently continue. That's not very helpful. You want to, it writes nothing, it saves nothing. You see nothing. It's terrible. Change this value to continue to actually see your right information messages. Super handy. Warning action. Same as the other actions. The default action for this warning action is continue. So you pop the action and then it just rolls right on. You can change this value to inquire, like I've shown you, to pause the processing and prompt for continuance. And here's some more details about common parameters. Okay. That's the call to action. So which preference do you prefer? If you do get variable preference, I'm gonna go ahead and jump over here and do that. I may be messing up my error, but I mean my, my slides, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Get variable preference. And here's all the preferences and here's their values. These are the default ones. I don't, I don't touch these. So you can go in here and you can check. You can say, all right, what's my confirm preference and what's my debug preference, et cetera, et cetera. Some of these have to do with the, the um, like your confirm options and my what ifs. You can change these. Please don't change these. I think I've said that enough times. Don't change the defaults. I said it so many times I even had a bullet read my mind. Seriously, just don't. Use the scoping of PowerShell to your advantage. Use the scopes. Instead of writing a script that goes in at the top and runs through and people you know, find it in the console and then run it, don't do that. Put it all in a function. Put all of your code in a function. And then at the bottom of your, your function code, call your function. It'll create a function scope. You can make all your changes in the function scope. And then when the script actually finishes and exits, the function scope is disposed of and none of your defaults have changed. It's just a better way to do it. So that's why I say write functions rather than scripts. Change the preference in the function if you must. This will not pollute the host scope. That's what I just said. All right, so let's talk about some points to write down. I had to get at least one more in, come on. Be thoughtful about your output, AKA, your streams of consciousness. Okay, I'll give you a second to think about that because you're being thoughtful. You're conscious. Okay, turn. Don't cross the streams. Like I said, don't don't send one into the other. Don't use them inappropriately. Use the right stream for the right things. Unless your code is fighting Gozer the Gozerian. If your code is fighting Gozer the Gozerian, then you can cross the streams. Other than that, hands off. Give a hoot, don't pollute. Woodsy the owl, well, thank you. 
You can remove wrinkles in your code with streams. You want your output to look its best. Do these jokes make you want to stream out loud? Maybe you should redirect your R. And don't play games with your output. Be stream powered. And yes, PowerShell Stream has a logo that I've created. Uh, rights reserved. Please don't sue me. Are there any questions? And I'd like to thank you for attending my presentation. Oh, wait, before I do that, um, please stay in touch. This is how you can find me. I'm on Twitter a bunch. This is my Discord handle. Uh, I'm not as often in the Bridge channel as I used to be, but I'm still around. You can still message me. Uh, just ping me. Uh, here's my LinkedIn. If you want to uh, follow me there, that's I keep that really professional. So it's all about jobs and pros and stuff like that. Here's my ICQ number. I'm not actually on ICQ, but you know that. Notice how low my number is. I was in very early in that sucker because I think they actually started at hundred thousand on the numbering. Uh, here's my blog where I post some crazy stuff like how to do search and replace using regex in VS Code, in case you want to know how to do that. And then here's my GitHub. And the thing that you all want, you want so bad, you want to be able to see this so that you don't have to type in links or do search. There's the GitHub, Stephen Judd, write commands. All of this code is up there. It's current. And uh, if you're even modestly interested, yes, you can see the answers to my jokes without having to run the code. All right, um, open floor. Anyone, anyone goes. Personally looking forward to checking out those. We got two microphones open and so we're getting some echo. Oops, I don't wanna do that, I'll stay here. Uh, you wanna say again? Oh, looking forward to checking out those slides. Yes, very much so. I must have covered this pretty well. There's zero questions. Not anything. Oh, you know what, Andrew? I, doggone it. I did not say, if you're not doing right output, what do you do? I did not point it out. This is what you do. You just put your object onto the pipeline or it's not actually the pipeline, you send it to the command processor. So instead of doing output, write output, don't do that. Just put your code directly out. So there, I wanted to, I wanted to explain that. Now again, remember, first thing that this does when it hits the command processor is it goes looks for out default to see if you have a custom handler for what this is gonna be in the output. Now, of course, I just sent it a ton of dots. So obviously there's no handler for that. So it goes, okay, well, you, you get whatever, you get the text processor. And so then that pipes it on down and that goes to out host by default. And then out host is what actually makes it show up on the console. Let's see, looks like we got some Comments, you covered everything, no questions. Good presentation, David, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hope you had some chuckles and some groans because the kind of comes with the territory for me. Uh, Ulysses, can you go back to write information with the parameter to write the info into a variable? Can you go back to write information with the parameter? You mean just show you the code? This part? Yeah, in this case, uh, message five is like an uh, array to send a lot of information or you overwrite if you write information message sometimes. Is it an array or is it? Are you talking about this one? Okay, so information variable. So uh, the advanced commandlets, so let me show you that right quick. 
Um, let me just do uh, get item. And I'll find an item here. Uh, let's see, what we're doing six, so I'll do six. Okay. And I'm going to do dash, and I'm going to do control space so we see all the parameters that are available to us. Notice that there's variables. Okay. So there's error variable here, there's warning variable, and there's information variable. And finally, we didn't talk about it because it wasn't part of this presentation, but there's out variable. And so one of the things you can do is not only can you see your information, oh, I didn't want to do that. I'm going to go over here to out variable. I'm going to pick that one. And then whatever you put after the variable parameter, whether it's the information variable, the warning variable, and the verbose variable, I think that was the other one. Is that right? Information, warning. Oh, now I've forgotten. Information, warning, error. Error, good grief. How can I forget the error one? Um, whatever goes after this, it's going to create a variable. So by the way, here's a mistake I make all the time. And I say, uh, I put the dollar sign in there. You can't do that. So you just do regular text and you say out variable output. All right, so what's gonna happen is it's gonna put it on the screen and it's going to also take whatever the output was and put it into the out variable dollar output. That's what this line 28 is doing, except instead of out variable, I'm using information variable. So whatever white information is putting out, it's going into variable message five, and that's where this comes from. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Okay, sweet. Let's see, David says, awesome stuff, Stephen. Thank you very much, David. I still see the don't use right host antique advice peddled. You're doing good work to denounce it. <laughs> so, I mean, there are people who are really tough on right host. They're like, don't use that crap. Like, well, it has its place. And if it's used intelligently, it really adds a lot of value. So I use it, but I also understand its limitations. I'm telling you, and I actually tweeted this out last week, I think, if right information had foreground color and background color, even though I never use background color, I only use foreground, then I would stop using right host pretty much entirely, because then I could just control the message and I could control the output and I'd have everything I wanted, which is I want the colors. I like putting out green text, red, I don't use red text, that's for errors. I like green text, yellow text, cyan, magenta, all that stuff catches my eyes. And again, a lot of that is for me, so I use it. Let's see, what were you trying to do with return in that try catch statement a while back? All right, let's go find, I'm gonna go find one. I think it's this one up here, this one has it. So here's right warning and then return. Is it this one we were talking about? I mean, they're, I was using return in a bunch of them, but uh, let's see. What's this for? Okay, so if I don't have this return, it's going to run the, the git host and pull that do the warning if i say if i say halt to continue it goes into the catch and writes the warning without this it then continues on closes out these sections and then starts doing the next code line without return it continues on through the code oh you guys are getting kicked out Bummer. Well, that's what happens when we start late and I talk your ears off. Yep, that's what's stopping, stopping the script. The other thing I could have done here, which I didn't do, which I tend to do, is I, I would have done throw. Now, 
Interesting thing about throw that you need to know about. I'm going to undo my change there. Oops. Yeah. One thing you need to know about throw, which I have not covered, is throw will honor your error action preference. So what is my current error action preference? My current error action preference is continue. If you set error action preference to silently continue and you throw, it may not stop. I haven't tried this, by the way. Let's try it here. This will be fun. Let's find out what happens live. If I can spell throw. Oh, good grief. Not even close. All right. Throw. I'm going to come and out return. And then up here, first thing I'm going to do is do exactly what I told you not to do, which is change error action preference to something other than the default. Silent. Where did my silently continue go? That's what we want. I'm going to F9 that because I want to see what happens and run. Okay. Get host, write warning. Go down here. Let's see, I want to tell it to halt. So it goes into the catch block, does the throw. And 10 use on. Look at that. So the difference between throw and uh, right error return is you can kind of you can see what happens here with the error action preference. That's why this is again, this is why I say don't change those preferences, leave them alone. If you really want to be paranoid with your with your code, set the error action preference to what the default should be. And then if you're using throws inside your code, you're guaranteed that it's going to do what you think it's going to do, which if I stop this processing and I run it again, let's run it again, F11, I keep pressing F11 when I should be pressing F5. Now I'm going to F11, F11, right warning down here one more time, just to show that we've proven this. And we're out. There we go. Okay. Any other questions? Go back to my title slide or my info slide. I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, I don't have anything else at the moment, so I can stick around, but this is probably a good place in the recording. Thank you all very much for your participation and allowing me to come and present this information to you today. And I hope you in, got some good information, got some terrible jokes, that's for sure. Maybe you grow, maybe you laugh but I hope you're entertained for sure. Thank you very much.